special. It's just a chorus, and you know it. But I want you to stand as we sing it. Oh, come, let us adore him. And I want us to let's worship Christ as we sing it, all right? Oh, come, let us Thank you, Brother Don. If you have your Bibles this morning and you'd like to follow the reading of God's Word, invite your attention this morning to two passages of Scripture. The first is found in the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 1 and verse 18. Some of you will swear that Don and I talked this morning before the service but I assure you that we didn't it is amazing how the Holy Spirit is able just to dovetail all of the details of services together I appreciate working with individuals who are sensitive to the leadership of the Holy Spirit Matthew chapter 1 verse 18 then I want you to turn with me if you will to Philippians chapter 2 and we will begin our reading in verse 9. Philippians chapter 2, beginning our reading in verse 9. Reading first in Matthew's Gospel, a very, very familiar account. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused, to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. I want you to notice especially in verse 21, thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And turn then to Philippians chapter 2. And in verse 9. Wherefore God also. Hath highly exalted him. And given, given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus. Every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Blessed Holy Spirit, settle over us this morning. 
We thank you for this beautiful atmosphere. We thank you for your manifested presence. But as we come now to the preaching of thy word, I ask for the aid of the Spirit that I might be able to somehow exalt and lift up Jesus. Father, I pray that you will open every heart and every mind. And I pray that this service will be one that we will long remember. And that somehow the Spirit of God might even work miracles in lives. Because we ask these things in that name which is above every name. The name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. One of the most beautiful accounts in all of the Bible is the history of the events which surround the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Gospel of Luke records these events from Mary's perspective. You know the very familiar story and how beautiful it is. As the angel appeared to Mary, and made a declaration to her that she had found favor with God. And because that she had found favor with God, that she was going to conceive and bring forth a son. And the angel was very specific to call his name Jesus, for he shall be great. And one of the great statements of consecration followed after she asked the question, how can these things be? And the angel said that the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee and the power of the Holy Spirit shall overshadow thee until that holy thing which is born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And the statement of consecration was this. Even though it would involve misunderstanding, even though it might involve what some people might consider to be shame. She said, be it unto me according to thy word. And in Matthew's gospel, we have these events recorded from Joseph's perspective. Mary was betrothed to Joseph. Joseph discovered that she was with child. Evidently because of a deep love for Mary. And also because he was a just and honorable man, he determined that they would reach a settlement or that he would put her away or they would break apart the relationship in a private way, not exposing her to public humiliation and shame. But while he thought on these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Joseph, fear not to take Mary for thy wife. For that holy thing which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. And in a starlight, starlight night in Bethlehem. Far away from the hustle and the bustle of all that was going on, Mary brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger and called his name Jesus. I'll never forget how hard it was. After three years of marriage, my wife came home one day. She had a sparkle in her eye and she seemed to be happier than I'd seen her for some time. And she said, we're going to be parents. After I fainted and after I began to pick myself up and began to realize all that was going to take place, we began to make plans for a child to come to our home. We began to work on a bedroom and began to change that to a nursery. And some of you have gone through that experience. 
and began to paint and then we would go out and uh, even very early on and we were looking for little high chairs and we were looking for beds and we were looking for various other things. I was looking for little baseball bats and looking for little helmets and, and all of that sort of thing. Most of you know that I had a beautiful daughter that came but I was looking for all of those other things. But one of the things that we would do every evening Connie bought a huge book that I think had every name of every child that had ever been born in the history of the world. I won't go quite that far, but there were a lot of names in that book. And we would sit down every evening religiously, and we would begin to go through that little book and try to figure the perfect name that we were going to give this child. And we would talk about this name. And then we'd talk about that name, and then we'd research what that meant. We'd, oh, no, we don't want that, or yes, that's what we do want, but we know someone like that, and maybe that wouldn't work, or maybe this won't work. And I mean, it went on and on and on and on. Really, until the very day that she was born, we were unsettled on the name. About two weeks before our child was to come, Connie was taken to the hospital. She developed phlebitis in her leg. The doctor said that it was very dangerous and so they put her in the hospital. In the hospital they began to give her medicine that was to thin her blood. And for approximately two weeks, she took that medication and was, and was unable to get up and move around and unable to do very little for they were afraid that a blood clot might break free and could literally be fatal. As we began to work through that process and wondering just exactly where it might lead, the doctor decided that it would be a very wise thing, rather than sending her home and then coming back to have the child just to go ahead, induce labor, and we would have it all in one trip. I remember as all of that began in a morning, and I thought in just a few hours, things will be uh, really revolutionized in a way, but I thought it would be over. The hours drew on through the afternoon and went on through the evening and on through the wee hours of the morning, went on through the night and even as the sun came up and I had not been to bed and Connie certainly was in much worse shape than I. And I wondered in my heart, wonder why the doctor just doesn't come and say, we'll do surgery. About 8.30 in the morning, the doctor came, said, Reverend Dean, I want you to sit down for a minute, and I want you to hear what I'm going to say. said, we're going to have surgery, but there's a reason why we've not wanted to have surgery. And I said, what's that? He said, because of the medication that your wife has been on, I want you to understand, as you sign this paper, you could literally, and I want you to understand, you're putting your wife's life in jeopardy. And that she probably, or could, won't say probably, but could literally bleed to death before we could get all of this stopped. As a young pastor, 2,000 miles away from home, though home was where I was pastoring, but 2,000 miles away from those who were dear to me, with a trembling hand, I signed my name and began to call people and ask them to pray. A little while later, the doctor came out, and as he took the mask off of his face, he said, I want to tell you something. I don't know who your God is, but something miraculous took place there this morning. He said, I think that it's probably as little blood as I've ever seen. In all of the years of this type of surgery, he said, I honestly believe that something miraculous has happened. When I knew that she was all right, I said, uh, is my daughter all right? Does everything work? He laughed and said, everything works. You want to come back and see her? I walked down a long hallway and looked into a little room and saw her there for the first time. Those of you that know that feeling, you know what I'm talking about. 
the feeling of pride and the feeling of joy, and it dawned on me, she doesn't have a name. And so I walked back through and I asked the doctor if I could go into the intensive care unit where Connie was. He said that it'd be all right, and I walked in. And I'm not trying to be melodramatic here, but literally she was lingering between life and death. As I walked up to the side of her bed, there was a gas, or there was a mask, an oxygen mask on her face and very weak. I touched her arm and she kind of woke and she looked over at me. I said, are you feeling all right? And she sort of mumbled something that I couldn't understand. And I looked at her and I said, Connie, I've been thinking. Why don't we call this child Heather? She looked up at me and through that mask, she whispered these words. That's a beautiful name. Name her, call her Heather. And somehow I believe on that starlit night when Mary wrapped her son in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger and she said his name shall be called Jesus. I think there was a ripple that began to go through the streets of glory and the angels began to say, oh, that's a beautiful name. That's a wonderful name. Among those men and women of faith who knew what that birth represented, I believe as they heard the name of Jesus, as they traversed the miles, as they worshipped at his feet, and they asked the mother, what is the name of the child? And she would say, his name is Jesus. I think they went away and traveled and said, that is a beautiful name for the hope that all that it would represent, all of the hopes of God, all of the hopes of mankind were wrapped up in the name of Jesus. Paul writing years later from a different viewpoint, not looking at the hope of what Jesus would be, but looking at what he'd achieved. Blessed be his name and what he had accomplished and the fact that he had lived a sinless life and the fact of his glorious ministry and the fact that he had gone to the cross and the fact that he had rose again triumphant. He said, wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him not just a beautiful name, but a name that is above every name, a name that every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. The songwriter says there's a name above all others. Wonderful to hear, bringing hope and cheer. It's the lovely name of Jesus, evermore the same. Let the world proclaim, what a lovely name, the name of Jesus. Reaching higher far than the brightest star, sweeter than the songs they sing in heaven. Oh, let the world proclaim, what a lovely, what a lovely name. I tell you this morning, that name is above every name. First of all, to the believer, and secondly, to the sinner. That name is a name above every name to the believer. For you see, to us who have believed on his name, we have found redemption in that name. The Bible says in Matthew 1, 26, and I read it in your hearing, call his name Jesus. For this purpose, because he will save his people from their sins. That word save is a very powerful word. As you begin to look at the concepts that it begins to give in the original, it is more than just simply save. 
It means that he is going to rescue from danger those who are held captive. And the concept conveyed is that sin, like an evil tyrant, has literally held captive men and women and boys and girls. But the angel said, call his name Jesus. For when he comes, he will save. He will rescue. He will set his people free from the terrible tyranny. From the terrible bondage. From the terrible captivity of sin. You remember a few years ago. When the PLO had taken some Israeli hostages. And it is amazing. And I admire oftentimes the little nation of Israel. They were holding them in an airplane at a certain airport. The Israelis didn't think they needed to go through diplomatic channels. And they didn't need to go through all of the other and try to work it out. They just sent in a band of commandos. And before it was over, they brought their people home. We tried to do that and, and uh, ran into each other with the helicopters and everything else a few years ago. That all happened. But they rescued their people. And they brought them home. And they rescued them from the captivity and the evil tyranny that was there. And Jesus came as God's son. And he walked into the arena of human life. And he walked into the arena where you live and where I live. And where all mankind had literally been bound and brought into tyranny. But he came to save, to rescue, to lead us away and to set us free. Oh, it means not only to rescue, but it means to restore to health. Talking about someone who is diseased and disease has literally eaten their body until there is no hope. But when this word saved was used, it meant that that person could be healed and restored to health and restored to vitality and restored Jesus came to restore health to diseased humanity. For sin in its real form is a disease that cripples and hurts and destroys. But call his name Jesus for he will save. He'll restore his people to health. Call his name Jesus for he shall save. It means to deliver from the penalty of judgment. It is the concept that a man has been found guilty of a crime and he is on death row and he is waiting for the executioner. It's not a matter if he is guilty. He has already been judged guilty. It's not a matter as if there's going to be punishment. Punishment is just around the door and around the corner. But a pardon comes from the governor that says, even though he's guilty, I will pardon him. And I'm not just simply staying his execution, I'm canceling it. It is a pardon that sets him free. Ladies and gentlemen, when Jesus came, he came not to just stay the punishment of sin. He came not just to put it off for a while. He came with a pardon and he set us free. And we don't have to suffer the horrible agonies of the penalty of sin. Because Jesus came as our Savior. It means to give a blessing that begins on earth, but extends to heaven and that's why we can begin to sing and, and begin to say that thank God that he has justified us and he has adopted us and he has regenerated us and he has literally brought us into the family of God. It begins on earth and it extends to heaven. Never will forget, I was just a new Christian back in 1964. Young man from the Bible college by the name of David Latimer came to our church at Reeb Avenue to preach one morning. Brother Klein was gone. He was our pastor at that time. David got up to, to sing, and I, he sang before he preached, and I never forgot that day. I believe that's the first time I ever saw him, first time I ever met him. After that first time, I fell in love with him as a friend and a brother, and I knew that his heart was beating like mine. For when he got up to sing, he and his wife... Merla sang together. I believe Merla's here today. 
began to sing a song that says, I've learned to know a name I highly treasure. Oh, how it thrills my spirit through and through. Oh, precious name beyond degree or measure. My heart is stirred whenever I think of you. And I watch Brother Latimer as he began to get to that chorus. And those of you that know David, he began to get blessed in his own heart. And when he was saying, my heart is stirred whenever I think of Jesus, that blessed name that sets the captive free, the only name through which I find salvation. No name on earth has meant so much to me. I thought as I listened to him that day and tears began to roll down my own cheek and I felt like I ought to run around the church or I was just about to explode and I thought, thank God for the name of Jesus that sets the captive free. And there is no other name on earth that has meant so much to me. Oh, we've found redemption in that name. We've been given rights or privileges in that name. For you see, in that name, we have right to access the very throne of God. Oh, the Bible says in John chapter 14 and verse 15, Whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, I will do it that the Father may be glorified in the Son. He said, hitherto have you asked nothing, ask that your joy may be full, and whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, that will I do. Last night after the service, dear lady came to me, tears rolling down her face. She said, I wish you'd pray for me and my family, and she began to talk about some of the things they were going through. I looked at her, and I've known her for years. I took her hand and I said, let's pray right now. She said, oh, I'd like to do that. And we just prayed just a few moments and began to give it to the Lord and began to lay the burden on the Lord and began to say, oh God, you just work it out. And when I prayed, I prayed in Jesus' name. And as I thought and, and knowing that I would be preaching this message this morning, uh, beginning to think in my own heart, uh, what a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer, uh, not just on prayer meeting night, uh, not just on Sunday morning when the invitation's given, uh, not just uh, uh, Sunday night, but whenever the burden is there, whenever the need is there, through the mighty name of Jesus, we have access to the very throne room of God. And we can come into his presence boldly, not in our own might, not in our own merit, but in his own name. We have the right of the fullness of the Spirit. For Jesus said in John 14, 26, And the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. Yes, there's the secret. He comes in the name of Jesus. The modern church needs to understand the Holy Spirit is not given for programs of, of human achievement. The programs of simply human exaltation and ideas. I hear a lot in the church these days about power and oh how we need power. And that's not saying that we don't need power. But I want to tell you, we need to understand that the power comes in Jesus' name. And as long as we're doing the work in Jesus' name, we have a right to ask God to come. We have a right to ask Him for His sanctifying presence, for His blessing and His enabling power, as long as it's in the name of Jesus. We have not only the right of access to the throne and the fullness of the Spirit, but we even have the right to direction in life. So what do you mean? There are some who sometimes become all divided. Shall we allow this? Shall we allow that? What shall we do? Shall we go here? Shall we not go there? There are standards. Some would say, well, what is the basis and what's the rule? Paul tells us in the book of Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17, and he just settles the whole matter. And he says, and whatsoever you do, in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. And if you can't do it in the name of the Lord Jesus, then don't do it. And if you can do it in the name of the Lord Jesus, and if his blessing and his glory is on you, then you can go ahead and do it. But that is the real standard of life. Doing it in the name of Jesus. We have been given redemption. We have been given rights. 
One day we'll be given a reward for the things that are done in that name. In Mark chapter 9 and verse 41, Jesus said that if someone would give a disciple a cup of cold water in my name, verily I say unto you, he will in no wise lose his reward. As I observe the church world today, I seem to observe that there are two types of service going on in some parts of the church. Some type of service is to men, for men, and by men. I'm not sure that I can go into all of the details here, but there are some who literally, their ministry is totally to men, for men, and completely measured only in the things that relate to men. But there is another side of service. And that service is, I'm not doing it to men, for men, by men, to be evaluated by men. But I'm doing it to God, for Jesus' sake. And you see, when you're doing it to God, for Jesus' sake, there are no thing, such things as upward mobility and downward mobility. It's just simply doing the will of God. And wherever the will of God leads, and whatever God's will is, it just simply says, for Jesus' sake, I'll do the big task, or I'll do the little task. Whatever it takes, or whatever it requires, I will do it in His name. The Bible says to those who do the work to men and for men and by men, verily they have their reward. But to those, and I've said this in more places than this platform, I think the real heroes of the church are those sometimes who labor in obscurity. Labor sometimes in places where hardly anyone knows that you're there. And giving yourself and giving of your very life and doing the best you can. Not really having much notoriety. But I want to tell you there's an eye that sees and there's an eye that knows. And I think the father at times looks at Jesus and says, oh, they're doing it in your name. And I'll reward it because it's in your name for your sake. Well, I was in Circleville Bible College. Man came to our chapel one day. Preached a message about consecration. And closed the message about a young lady. That really was very socially adept and very, very well off in her life. Had great dreams for her life. And she was in a missionary convention. And the Lord began to deal with her heart in a mighty way about doing missionary work. And she came to an altar of prayer and wrestled and struggled. She had such dreams. She had such plans. And those of her parents and those that knew her had such dreams for her life. And she struggled and she wrestled. Until finally she said, Lord, for Jesus' sake, if that's what you want, I'll write over my life in red letters. For Jesus Hey. And she gave up the social standing and she gave up some of her dreams. The years passed, she found her way to India in a medical clinic and was working there among some of the poorest of the poor. And there were some American tourists that were coming through that area one day and they were seeing the various sites of that particular part of India. And they came to the little mission compound where she was. They didn't know who she was. They didn't know what her background was. She was dealing and trying to help a child that had several infections and pus was running down the child's face. And she was trying to swab that infection and trying to bring healing. And the tourist walked by and looked at her and said, little girl, I want to tell you something. I wouldn't do what you're doing for a million dollars. Tears began to well up in her eyes and she bit her lip for a moment. Finally, she looked back up and she said, Mister, I want to tell you something. I wouldn't either. 
There's only one reason I'm here. It's for Jesus' sake. And I'm going to serve him for Jesus' sake. He's called me to do it for Jesus' sake. There are some things you and I ought to just simply go through for Jesus' sake. Well, I'm going to give them a piece of my mind. For Jesus' sake, just forbear. Well, you don't know what they did. For Jesus' sake, just simply lay it aside. Well, I'm not going to teach those kids. They're rowdy and they're wild. And, and I get home late. For Jesus' sake, I'll do it. I don't want to drive that bus. I never get home. And, and I never have time. For Jesus' sake, I'll just simply do it. And the Lord says, if you do it in my name, verily I say unto you, you shall in no wise lose your reward. I want to tell you that's almost enough to make a Quaker shout and say amen. Amen. That name speaks to the body of believers in the church as I hurry. For you see in that name we find our message. There are many messages coming from the church today and I realize and I know that we're living in a complex age. There are many who would like to help us believe that the old gospel is so far out of tune and so far out of date that it really can't just meet the needs of people today. But I want to tell you what the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I want to tell you the gospel that was good for our fathers and the gospel that was good for our forefathers and the gospel that built this great tabernacle and the gospel of preaching Christ that has brought men and women by the thousands, yea, by the millions to the foot of the cross. I tell you, even in 1990, that gospel will still reach to the very deep of the hearts of men and still meet the deepest needs that are represented there. And in all of our doing and in all of our of what we're doing, I'm not saying that we ought to let all those things go, but I'm saying in our recreation, let it somehow lead to the name of Jesus or it is in vain. In our counseling, let it somehow lead to the name of Jesus or it is in vain. In all of the other ministries that we have, in our outreach ministries, in all that we do, not saying do away with those things. Don't misunderstand me. I'm saying let it lead to the name of Jesus. For he alone can still satisfy the longings of an aching heart. And the longings of a broken spirit. And he alone can bring healing. And it's in the name of Jesus that we find our message. And there is no other message. We have been raised up. Bob Hoots told our camp at Indoor Camp in Columbus, we have been raised up to preach Christ. Oh, there are other things we preach besides that and, and because of that. But primarily, we are raised up and we are called to represent and to preach the Lord Jesus Christ in all of His beauty. Oh, we find in that beautiful name as a church, we find our power. For you see in Mark chapter 16 and verse 17, Jesus said, in my name, you'll be able to cast out demons. Or let me put it just in a, in a modern language. In my name, not only be able to cast out demons, and I do take that literally, but for most of us, we'll probably never have that experience. But if in his name you can overcome the evil one and all of the hordes of hell in his name. Many of you remember my grandmother on the Johnson side. I referred to her a little bit yesterday morning. Never knew her to be well. Never knew her knew a day in her life that she was well. There were times as a boy that I would be either at the house or sometimes over at this cottage. And when she seemed to be in the most pain, when she seemed to be going through a very difficult time, I would hear her whisper, Jesus. And I wondered, why does she do that? Why doesn't she say more than just Jesus? Why doesn't she pray, Lord, help me? Or why, why does she just say Jesus? It was not until after I was converted at the age of 16 one day I was standing in our local church, had a hymn book, and we were singing the old familiar song, 
Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. I came to the verse that says, take the name of Jesus with you as a shield from every snare. When temptations round you gather, just breathe that holy name in prayer. Precious name, oh how sweet, joy, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. And it began to dawn on me in that service that when she lifted the name of Jesus, that the enemy had to flee, that the enemy had to go, that there was no power, there was no might, even in affliction, even in heartache, even in difficulty, even in hard circumstances, that when she lifted the name of Jesus, Jesus, and begin to pray Jesus there was power there was deliverance there was help there was comfort there was victory there was glory in his name and I tell you some of you that are going through and you are going through and you face things day after day I tell you today there is power in that name. There is power in the name of Jesus. When they're cursing and swearing around you, you don't have to get down and have a Mount of Praise camp meeting, but you can breathe the name of Jesus. And all of a sudden, the demons of hell have to flee. When you're going through the darkest days of your life and you feel like you can't pray, Sometimes the burden rolls on us so heavy that we feel like we just can't pray. And when we try to pray and we try to offer words to God, but the words aren't there and it just seems that it's all dried up. Just lift that name in prayer, Jesus. Jesus, for in that name there is power to bring you victory and to bring you deliverance and to bring you glory. I say this. As I begin to close, Jesus is not only a name above every name to the believer, but it is a name above every name to the sinner. For the Bible says in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, Neither is there salvation in any other. All of the others are, are, are imposters. They're pretenders. The word of God is clear, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. And I just address you this morning if you're in this auditorium. You're without Christ and you're unsaved. I address especially, though I don't see you well, the teenagers in the back. I want to tell you that this is a name above every name. For you see, the name of Jesus speaks of salvation. And his name represents one who cares. There are people who tell me no one cares whether I live or die. No one cares what I do to my own life. It's my life. No one really cares about me. Whether that's true or not. On a human level, I tell you, there is one who cares, and the name of Jesus represents one who cares deeply about your life, and he cares deeply when you hurt, and he cares deeply about the things that you do in your life. He cares about you, whoever you are and wherever you're at. That name represents one who can cleanse <laughs> and forgive. Oh, you say, Brother David, I'm so ashamed in my life of some of the things I've done. There are scarlet sins on my life. I want to tell you, the blood still goes deeper than the stain of sin is gone. And he can cleanse those embarrassing things in your life. He can cleanse those things that you're embarrassed about and you never want to talk about. He can cleanse those things and make you just as if you'd never sinned and make you free. And he can make you to where you can know that it's all forgiven and put under the blood. It's a name that represents one who can deliver. Brother David, I'd love to get saved, but I've got a drug habit. Brother David, I'd love to get saved, but you see, I've got an addiction of some kind that I can't free myself from. Brother David, I'd love to get saved, but there are so many chains in my life that I just can never find help. I can never be released. 
Oh, there is one who can deliver Jesus, the name that charms our fears, uh, that sets the captive free, uh, his music in the sinner's ear. Uh, and ladies and gentlemen, understand today that his grace, uh, his power, his blood, his name can deliver you from whatever binds you. Say, preacher, there's no one here in this auditorium that's afflicted with a drug habit. I don't believe that for a moment. I believe there are some people here in this tabernacle today you're struggling with it every day of your life. Say, preacher, there are not people here that are afflicted with things that they can't free themselves from. Don't you dare believe it. I believe there are scores of people in this tabernacle right now, right in this very morning, that are trying to get free and they're trying desperately. I want to tell you and I point you to one whose name is Jesus of Nazareth. And the Bible says he shall save or deliver or break loose the shackles of sin. Is the name who represents one who bids you to come. He asks you to come. You see in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 10. It is not only a name that speaks of salvation. But it's a name that speaks of exaltation. For the Bible says that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. And in verse 11, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. One day we will bow. The whole world will bow. One day every tongue will confess. You see, it's not a matter of will I confess Christ as Lord. The question is when. For you see, if we do it now, the door of mercy is ajar. And, the, and, and God is dealing and pleading and working. And he'd love to bless and save and cleanse and deliver. And all of the other things that I've talked about. Oh, that we would do it now. Or will we do it then? When the door of mercy is closed. And when instead of meeting him as savior, we're meeting him as judge. And instead of meeting him as one who, who is really willing to do something great in our lives. We're meeting him. As one who will finally pronounce judgment on our lives. It's not a matter of will I confess Christ. Those of you that may be in this tabernacle this morning. You're saying oh but I'm educated and nothing wrong with being educated. And I'm doing that myself. But I don't believe in this Jesus. I don't believe that he is Lord. See it's not a matter of if you will confess him. It's a matter of when. Say, well, yeah, I'm a very scientific mind and I don't believe anything unless I can see it, unless I can hold it, unless I can touch it. It's not a matter of when. It's not a matter of if. It's a matter of when. Every tongue will, will confess and every knee will bow. There are some people here this morning maybe need to pray. There are some of God's people here this morning. You're facing circumstances situations that are bigger than you and I want to tell you in the name of Jesus you can bring it here and you can lay it at his feet and we'll pray with you about it there are some people that are unsaved and that are struggling I want to tell you you can come and let Jesus have his own way in your life with our heads bowed and our eyes closed and before you stand for just a moment I've asked Don if he would to just sing a little chorus that is a beautiful chorus I learned not long ago. And it just simply says, cherish the name of Jesus. And I want Don to sing this through maybe twice while we're seated. And there are some people here this morning that you're carrying a burden that's too heavy for you. In the name of Jesus, I bid you to come and let him have his way. There are some of you that are unsaved. Even before we stand and give the official invitation, why don't you come and pray? Will you bow your heads and just pray softly as Don sings this beautiful chorus? Cherish that beautiful name. Cherish that
that name is Jesus. Cherry, you want to pray this just to worship the Lord this morning. Early in, this, in the early morning hour as I was alone with the Lord, I asked him for one thing, Lord, help me to lift up Jesus and help us just to worship you. And I've done the best I know how to do that this morning. And I want to tell you, if your heart's troubled, if there's a burden in your soul, if you're not saved, if you're not sanctified, if there's need of any kind in your life, as we worship the name and the person of Jesus, if you want to pray, come on, we're not going to tarry long. Sing it with Don and Cheryl, if you will. Cherish that beautiful name. We come in the matchless name, in the name that is above every other name, the name of Jesus our Lord and our Savior. Lord Jesus, accept our worship this morning, for we do love you and we do adore you and we bow before you today and we thank you for the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now, Father, for those that are kneeling around the altar, I pray in Jesus' name that their needs might be met, that their lives might be touched, that the power of God can be revealed in their lives. And Father, for the host of us here this morning, the Lord, we're worshiping you, and we do cherish your name. Accept our worship and help us to go in the strength and in the power of that beautiful name. Amen. Don, lead us in it once more, and then we'll be dismissed. Uh, let's sing it once more.
be helpful if we had some more ladies together here at the altar as we prepare to go. I know uh, ladies, several of you would just gather in. Don't leave it to someone else to do. I'd like for you to come. If you had your son or daughter or mother here or sister, I know you ladies would want somebody to be praying with them. We want you to come and to demonstrate your love and support to these. I appreciate that. Thank you. It's time for the lunch hour. Afternoon service is at 2 o'clock. will be the ordination service. Do come back. God bless you as you fellowship together on the grounds during the lunch hour. You're dismissed.